the occupation of Tibet by the Chinese has already completed 70 years. What China has called peaceful remains to be a history of conflicts and interests between the people of Tibet and the Chinese Communist Party. The 7th year anniversary was symbolic in so many ways, especially the remarks made from the Holy Potala Palace. Question that hover are all drawn towards the intentions of the Chinese Communist Party. The Kootniti exclusively brings you an interview with the spokesperson of CTA's Department of Information and International Relations. Greetings to our viewers. Welcome and thank you for joining us in today's conversation on Tibet's future. With regards to the new Chinese policies, we are joined by Mr. Tenzin Lakshe, official spokesperson of the Department of Information and International Relations of the Central Tibetan Administration. Mr. Lakshe, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Let's begin with the first question. China marked the 70th anniversary of the capture of Tibet and it made a speech at the Potala House, which was quite symbolic for the people of Tibet. So can you explain the symbolism and what possible message the Chinese have sent the people of Tibet? Uh, see, Arjita, thank you so much for inviting me for this conversation. Uh, with regard to the question, uh, it's very symbolic, first of all. And uh, symbolic for the Tibetan, what we felt is, right in front of Potal Palace, we are holding this a grand ceremony of the so-called a peaceful liberation of Tibet, which was in fact not a peaceful liberation, but a brutal occupation of Tibet. And in front of Potala Palace, because Potala Palace is the uh, the residence of His Holiness Dalai Lama, who used to be our ruler, our political leader of Tibet since by like, 1642, right? So till 2011, but before 2011, His Holiness was our leader, our political leader. So it symbolizes a much about how Tibetan issue is very much important to China. 70 years has passed, which China claims that they have peacefully liberated, which China claims that they have developed Tibet from, right, from the, the medieval era European country, right, came to the, uh, now the poverty elevated society. Whatever they claimed, right, what important for China is still, right, still China need to understand the sentiments of the Tibetan people, the aspirations of the Tibetan people. What we felt is, several years is gone, but still China couldn't understand the real issue which China need to give to the Tibetan people. But they have crushed the Tibetan sentiments for long, when they occupied Tibet, it was brutal, it was forceful. They killed right, thousands of people, right? they destroyed the monasteries. They it could, not, could not cultivate the mind of the people. After, after that, they, tapped, they thought that it was not working, so they tried to abuse the Tibetan by flushing money, by putting development projects inside Tibet. But still, was not sufficient for China to win the hearts of the Tibetan people. So the question remains, but even after 70 years of Tibet, 70 years of Chinese occupation, right, what was the problem? Right, our China tried to be jubilant of the so-called peaceful liberation, or are China scared right, about their own stability? Right? and their legitimacy over Tibet. So that is symbolic because see, not just 70 years celebration, but before that Xi Jinping himself visited Lhasa, right? He visited northeastern part of Tibet, he visited Lhasa, Ninti, all these places. Then after, right now we can see that more and more political members are visiting Tibet. Follow up to his visit, Wang Yang visits, right? And he, he visited with uh, Wu Chang, then after that, Li Xi, then Cha, uh, Kao Chi, and all, all the political members of the Chinese Communist Party, one after another, they visit Tibet. So that shows that Tibet is a very important issue for China. 
speaking of uh, Wang Yang, who is in charge of uh, bringing in together all the ethnic uh, communities in China, he recently had made a statement on this celebration, and I would like to quote, that Tibet can only develop and prosper under the party's leadership and socialism. So what do you feel about the future intentions of the Chinese Communist Party with regards to Tibet? So for these 70 years of Chinese occupation, what Wang Yang and Xi Jinping said about is that whatever happens inside Tibet, all the credit goes to the policies which was implemented by the Chinese Communist regime. Right. Whatever the policy has implemented from the state, right, because of that, there was a, a prosperity inside Tibet. But somehow, in this 70 years, so called 70 years celebration, right, and during Xi Jinping's visit also, now they try to put the Tibetan people away from the legitimizing Tibet by ownership of the Tibet, right. When you listen to his statement, right, he will never ever talk about the Tibetan people, but rather he talks about all the ethnic people inside Tibet. So therefore, right now, what happens, the problem is the Tibetan people should be the honor of the, the Tibet. Right? Historically, culturally, societal, whatever it is there for, his, like for thousands of years, the Tibetan peoples are the masters of the Tibet. Now China felt that because they're scared. They're scared. They have a fear of unstable Tibet. So what they try to do, the tactic, the new tactic which they formulate is to try to divert or try to disintegrate, try to distant the Tibetan people from the ownership of Tibet. So therefore, whatever it is there, I don't think that China is going to succeed in their right, mission to legitimize the ownership of Tibet. But they haven't, because see, the problem is they don't have the real understanding of Tibet. The problem is that they don't have a concrete policy on Tibet also. And they don't have a historical legacy as well. But for over years, they've been claiming Tibet being a part of China since 7th century. Then it goes down to 13th century, then to Ming, Qing and all these things. And then they go back to time immemorial or antiquity. Right. So they are again playing with the history. They don't have a kind of a, a legitimate right uh, authorizations over Tibet by claiming that Tibet was part of China. So I believe that China is still confused in their policy projections on Tibet. Right. So, but I would say that if China really wants to help Tibet, they need to look at the aspirations of Tibet people. Otherwise, they cannot. Right. They cannot win. You mentioned time and again that China does not have the understanding of the Tibetan people. But China has again, time and again, recognized the Panchen Lama, which is elected by them, and views His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to be a separatist element. So do you feel that China's cultural assimilation has started to work for the people in Tibet under this Chinese influence? Uh, the cultural assimilation is a kind of a new dimension which China is playing around. But Earlier, what happened is they tried to right, eradicate mm. right, the Tibetan culture in the early days when China came into Tibet, destroyed. At that time, there was a cultural revolution also. Even it impacts Tibet a lot. We used to say that 6,000 monasteries were being destroyed by inside Tibet. Now, after 1980s, where there was a, uh, a little relief Right, of liberalization. So there was a kind of a re renovation of Tibetan monasteries. Right, the Tibetan cultures were also being improved or preserved or resurrected. Right, but somehow now China wants to play around with the Tibetan culture. When you look at Tibetan culture, it's not because they felt dear to the Tibetan culture, it is only for political reason. The way they right, uh, recognize the Panchen Lama against the tradition is simply for political reason. If you look at the Chinese upon Panchen Lama, but right, whenever he moves to Tibet, 
There is a political reason behind that. They want to show to the world that everything is fine inside Tibet. There is a religious freedom exercise in Tibet. But somehow at this present stage, Tibet has become a living museum. But just for the people to tell that everything is fine. They have a new, nice building, monasteries, but the monasteries were supposed to be the learning center where the monks and nuns, right, for years, they developed these studies, they, they have the curriculums, but now everything has been monitored and managed by the Chinese Communist Party. Even the curriculums, right, even they have a, a strict a monastery management system also, but where uh, people from outside controls and, and uh, be a surveillance and monitor what are doing inside the monastery. So what happened is right now China claims that whatever happens is good and prosperity, but somehow there is a very serious threat to the Tibetan culture. But because they know that the Tibetan culture is the threat to the existence of the party. But they felt that. But in fact, it was not. But because as long as Tibetan culture sustains, they felt the threat. So therefore, when you look at Larungar monasteries, they destroyed right? Larungar. They, they completely like wiped out the entire kind of a thing. Right? Then, then there are lots which China suppressed. So therefore, uh, we believe that at present time, inside Tibet, there is a serious threat of cultural genocide going on inside Tibet. Referring to the cultural genocide which you just stated, do you feel that there is some sort of a parallelism between what is happening with the people of Tibet and the people in the province of Xinjiang? How does liberation for the people of Tibet be best described by you? Uh, there are, obviously, there are similarities. Uh, first thing, if you look back to history, but Tibet was not a part of China, even East Turkestan also. But when the communist regime came, then they occupied. There was an expansionist mode by mission, which is in the mind of the Mao Zedong. And then he expanded right, the China to the far right, west Xinjiang area. Right. So even Tibet also, they occupied, right? They expanded, right? In the name of, right, uh, putting all others into motherland, areas and the motherland, but territories and the motherland. But somehow, there are similarities. For Xinjiang, right now, whatever happens inside Xinjiang, but right, was already being there in Tibet, but it was not visible enough for the world. Because Tibet, not much information are coming from Tibet. They are strictly controlled. Every media, everything, communication level, everything is controlled. Even the movement of the people are also being controlled. Before 2008, we used to say that there are around more than 3,000 in average people coming from Tibet to India. But this year, only seven people. Right. So it goes down. If they are physical movement, that means that the flow of information is there. Right. And they have a latest technologies over there, right, which can curve the information to pass it to the outside world. Right. So not much information are coming from Tibet. Very strict. Even in Xinjiang also. When you look at Xinjiang, the party secretary himself, Chen Tai he used to be a party secretary in Tar. Tibet autonomous region. So he had already set that parameter inside Tibet and then exercised that one in Xinjiang or East Turkestan. So it was quite successful for him right, to curb the people in East Turkestan. So they are, therefore, obviously there are violations of human rights inside Tibet. The same goes to East Turkestan, but there is a serious, right, uh, uh, cultural genocides going on over there also the same thing right and obviously human rights violations right not just in Xinjiang or East Turkestan or Tibet but everywhere in China right 
is not just with Tibet, everywhere in China, right? The human rights are violated by the communist regime. Right? So therefore, it's a serious case, but right? it is not just about the people, the, the aspirations of the East Turkestan and the Tibetan people, but all of China, all of Chinese people. So the last question, since you mentioned of India, India has been a long-standing ally of Tibet, and uh, the, uh, for not only Tibet, but as well as the people of Tibet. So do you think that India can mediate some sort of a peaceful resolution between China and Tibet, and also thereby sort out its own border problems with China? Yes, India is very important. But India being uh, grateful to us, but for the Tibetan people, Right, and we being uh, India being a gracious host for us also over here, right, and the sentiments of the Tibet uh, of the Indian public, right, is very much with us. The solidarity is right for Tibet was very much over the last sixty years, but right? it became stronger and stronger emotionally. But right? somehow I believe that India. Unlike any other countries, India bears a witness to the Tibetan historical issue. India was our close neighbor. India knows about Tibet issue. India has its own mission inside Tibet. India has its own trade mission inside Tibet. Right. So they were historical connection with China, India, cultural connection with India. Right. Uh, even the trade also, economic connections also, right? So there are whole composite of connections, right? Like language, religion, the Buddhism was being introduced from India, then flourish in Tibet. So the package was full, right? So India have to support Tibet issue. And it is not for the sake of Tibetan people. I remind you, it is not for the sake of the Tibetan people. India need to help Tibet so that India can also sustain, right? It is in India's stake, it is in India's self-interest that they need to help the Tibet issue, resolve the Tibet issue, right? So unless until Tibet issue gets resolved, the border issue obviously, as we can understand, right, connects with history, right? The border issue between India and China was traditionally a border between Tibet and India. So therefore, we believe that when the Tibet issue resolves, the border issue will automatically resolve, has a space to resolve. Otherwise, what happens is there is a tension on the history, but historical tension. So once the tension is released, then only there is a progress. Otherwise, it cannot, it's difficult. Right. Every bit of pieces has its own history. And for thousands of years, on the other side of Himalaya, it was Tibet, not the China. Right now, the Indians talk to the China to resolve the issue. So they are an outsider. In fact, they, they are supposed to be the outsider talking about the inside politics. So therefore, it is for India's interest right, to help resolve the Tibet issue, right, to sustain the Tibet issue to lift the Tibetan issues to the next level, right? So therefore, it is very important for India right, to show the solidarities, to support Tibet for the sake of India's interest as well. Thank you, Mr. Lakshay, for joining us. It has been an honor to conversate with you. And don't forget to follow the Food Meeting for more updates on international relations and the economy. Thank you so much, Arjita, for giving me this opportunity. And looking forward to see you again.